It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer. That gives each of you, as a believer priest, the opportunity to name your sins to God if necessary. 1 John 1 9 says, If we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. We name our sins to God the Father only as part of privacy, and that will allow you to be filled with God the Holy Spirit. The Bible says God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we've forgotten. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the portion of the Word we know tonight. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. By way of announcement, I will be on vacation from July 15th to 23rd. And, uh, of course, some people uh, come in on Sunday, and so there will be two Sundays I will not be here. And, of course, during the week I won't be here either. And that's July 16th to the 23rd. I'll be deep sea fishing, etc. And uh, so that's that. Uh, but uh, what we're studying now is the fact that we are what is called a client nation to God. We're the United States of America. It's the 4th of July, so I'm going to do something special for this holiday. We are a client nation to God, meaning we are set apart as a nation to God. And as a client nation to God, we have certain responsibilities. That is, a pastor should teach the Word of God. That is, many pastors in a nation should teach the Word of God. The client nation also sends out missionaries to other nations, such as Africa, Asia, etc. A client nation also has many believers, as do we, and many believers who take an interest in the Word of God. And this is what we'll be studying, the client nation. Now, first of all, we're in deep trouble as a nation. Some of you, all of you probably know that in some way or another. People can't stay married. Uh, everything just uh, seems to be going to pot. And it's true. We're in a lot of trouble as a nation. And the reason why, it's uh, more than what you see on the surface. Because no one cares for the Word of God anymore. That's why. It's because uh, everybody's lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Nothing wrong with pleasure. I have pleasure every day. But when you love pleasure more than God, there's a problem. And this is what's happened to our country. And it's sad. And it saddens me. And it should sadden you, because uh, what has happened is, well, let's look at Hosea. I was going to save that for later, but we're going to turn to Hosea chapter 4, verse 1. Hosea 4, 1. If you want to know why our nation is having so many problems, just look here. And I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about something deeper than politics. I'm talking about the Word of God. And this is what the Word of God says. And actually, Hosea was written to the Jews. And the whole story behind Hosea was he had a uh, wife who was unfaithful to him. And God said to Hosea, This wife who was unfaithful to you, she's just like Israel. And yet... Hosea bought her back out of slavery, that is, the wife that was unfaithful. So Hosea 4.1 is what Hosea has to say about Israel, but it applies today. It applies to our country. And let's see what it has to say. Hosea 4.1. Actually, 4.1 through 4.7. Hear the word of the Lord, O Israelites. For the Lord has a covenant lawsuit against the people of Israel. He does so against the people of the United States recently. For the Israelites demonstrate neither truthfulness nor loyalty, nor do they acknowledge God. Verse 2, there is only cursing, that is slander. It's Hosea 4.1. There is only cursing, lying, Murder, 
stealing and adultery. Well, that sums up a lot of the things that occur in our country. They break every moral restraint and bloodshed is replayed, repaid with more bloodshed, revenge motivation. For three, therefore the land will mourn and all its inhabitants will perish. The beast of the field, the birds of the sky, and even the fish in the sea will perish. The Lord's dispute against the sinful priesthood is what we'll note next in 4.4. What we'll note next is the Lord's dispute against the sinful priesthood. And if they had a different means of communication in the Old Testament, today we have pastor teacher in the Old Testament, they had Levitical priests. And at this point, the Levitical priests were going away from the Word of God. They were not teaching the Word of God anymore. They were uh, teaching other things. So 4.4, four, do not let anyone accuse or contend against anyone else. For my case is against you. You know what that means? Don't blame the politicians. Who's God's case against? The believers, especially the priesthood, especially those teaching or who should be teaching the word of God. Do not let anyone accuse or contend against anyone else. Don't blame George Bush. And if Hillary Clinton becomes president, don't blame Hillary Clinton. Don't blame anybody. Look at yourself first and see if you've been living your spiritual life. And if you can say, I have then you'll be a blessing to your country. If you look at yourself and say, I have not been living my spiritual life, you're cursing to it. It all lies on the believer's shoulders. Do not let anyone accuse or contend against anyone else. For my case is against you, O priesthood. And the priesthood here is dealing with the communicators of the Word of God in the Old Testament, the Levitical priesthood. These would be comparable to pastor teachers today. 4-5, you stumble day and night. And the false prophets stumble with you. You have destroyed your own people. This is a testimony against the communicators of the word of God. They've destroyed their own people. Why? They don't even know what they're talking about. They stumble day and night. They're false prophets. And uh, what this is saying is the blind leading the blind. A bunch of blind people leading a bunch of blind people into a pit into a pit called the fifth cycle of discipline, which we've noted in the past. 4-6. Now why is a nation destroyed? If our nation is ever destroyed, and we're heading in that direction, Hosea 4-6. If our nation is ever destroyed, this is why. My nation is destroyed from a lack of knowledge. Does it say my nation is destroyed because of sin? No. It says, my nation is destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. Whether you know it or not, we all have an old sin nature and we all sin. Just take a look at 1 John 1 8 and 1 John 1 10, and you can see that for yourself. 1 John was written to believers, and all believers sin. We all have an old sin nature. And if you say you're sinless, let me ask your wife about it. <laughs> you're not sinless. We are all sinners. Even after we believe in Christ, we continue in the old sin nature. Now, we do have a solution called 1 John 1 9, which is right in between 1 John 1 8 and 1 John 1 10. 1 John 1 9 says, If we name our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. So, we do have a solution as believers. And that's not a license to sin, it's a license for you to live your spiritual life. And so, uh, if you're just curious, on your off time, I write it down, say 1 John 1 8 and 1 John 1 10. What does it say? It says you're a sinner. All of us. Before we believe and after we believe. We're still sinners. The old sin nature doesn't leave us. Adam's original sin does not leave us just because we believed in Christ. Now we should uh, resist it. We should actually, as Hebrews says, uh, resist sin to the point of blood. But uh, we never make it. We're flawed. And therefore God gives us a great solution. 1 John 1, nine. For believers. So why is a nation destroyed? Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge of what? this. If you don't understand the Word of God, then you're a reason why the nation is suffering. And our nation is suffering in so many ways. It's terrible. People can't even remain married anymore. And that's not always any one individual's fault, but it just shows a symptom. It's a symptom of the culture. Just turn on MTV. You'll see all kinds of stuff they wouldn't even play 50 years ago. 
And I don't mean to sound on the legalistic side. I'm just telling you our culture's going down the tubes. Our country is in serious trouble as we begin to celebrate this 4th of July, not to depress anyone, but just to let you know that we have a responsibility as believers to do what? Have knowledge. Knowledge of what? The Word of God. And how do you get it? By listening to it. Why do I teach every day? Not because I'm out of my head, but because I want people to have knowledge of the Word. Look at this thing. You think you can learn this once a Sunday? You think you can learn this from back to back once a Sunday? No, you can't. Impossible. And it's something that you just have to learn. I mean, uh, pastors go to seminary and they have to beat their brains out. And why is that? So they can be able to get up and teach. But what do most pastors do when they leave the seminary? They sell their books back. They don't even keep them. And why not? They don't really care either. They're the priesthood, as it were. They're the ones who should be teaching the Word, but they're not. And I'm telling you, that's what's happening to our country. They're just... uh, What you would call them now is men-pleasers. They're just looking to line their pockets with money. They're looking to have a dog and pony show. They're looking to pull people in through some type of gimmick. It's not what it's about. It's about the Word of God. It's about nothing else. So you stumble day and night. That's the false prophets. And then 4.6, my nation is destroyed from a lack of knowledge of the Word of God. Because you have rejected the principle of knowing doctrine, I have rejected you from being a priest nation to me. That continues 4.6. We are a client nation to God. That means priest nation, as it was in the Old Testament today. We are a priest nation. If you don't think the United States is set apart, you're kind of strange, because it is. I remember going to Washington, D.C., and this uh, lady was with her young son. He must have been 11 or 12. And she was sitting on the steps of the, uh, I believe it was the Lincoln Monument. And you know, if you go to Washington, D.C., all throughout Washington, D.C., there's mentions of God everywhere, on every placard. And it talks about freedom, and it talks about God, and it talks about how God has given us freedom. And they try to stamp it out today, but all over Washington, D.C., it's on about every monument you can find. God this, God that. And it's because this nation was founded on the Word of God. Whether people agree with that or not, I don't care. That's the truth. And it was founded on the Word of God. And this woman was very wise. I don't know uh, I don't know anything about her. I just overheard her talking to her son. And she said, look, son. This nation was founded on principles related to the fact that uh, there's a God. And she said, God has a special purpose for this country if we just follow that purpose. And she was speaking as only a woman could to her child and communicating as only a woman could to her child because women are very good communicators with children. Usually men have a harder time. Not always, but usually. And so she said this and he just nodded his head like he understood it. And it's true. This nation has a a special purpose. And uh, we are around the world today for one reason only, and that is so we can evangelize the lost and dying world. So I have rejected you from being a priest nation to me. That's That's the way we're heading. Since you have rejected Torah, that the Torah was the Old Testament, since you have rejected the Word of God, I, even I, will neglect your citizens. This is what happens when a nation goes away from the Word of God. If you want to know what translation I'm going off of, it's uh, pretty close to the NIV. I believe that's what I got that one from, the NIV. 4-7. The more the priests increased numerically, that is, there were a lot of priests coming up and teaching. They weren't teaching the Word, though. They were teaching things that were opposite of what the Word of God says. The more the priest increased numerically, the more they rebelled against me. You can look around Anderson and and see church after church after church on every corner. And, uh, well, there's an increase numerically in the number of people teaching, but are they teaching the Word? This is something you have to find out for yourself. The more the priest increased numerically, the more they rebelled against me. They have turned their glorious calling into a shameful disgrace. Many pastors have done the same thing to this country. They've turned their calling into a shameful disgrace. And you say, what are you talking about? How do you know that? 
because they do dog and pony show to get people in. If somebody's interested in the Word of God, let them be interested in the Word of God. Not a dog and pony show. Not something to pull people in just because they want to be entertained. The Bible calls that itching ears. And don't go to listen to somebody just because you have an itching ear. Uh, we all have entertainment. We as a culture love entertainment. We watch television. I watch television. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with entertainment. But when you bring it into the realm of spirituality, it doesn't work. You're not here today to be entertained. At least I hope not. If that was your intention, you're at the wrong place. You're not going to be entertained. If anything, what I say is going to step all over your toes, probably. Maybe, maybe not, depending on uh, what you've been raised in, etc. But the fact is, from Hosea, these people are a disgrace because they've stopped teaching the Word. And what happens when you stop teaching the Word? Let's look at Hosea 8, 7 and 8, 8. This is what happens when you stop teaching the Word of God. Or when you ignore the Word of God as a believer. Either way. Hosea 8, 7. They sow to the wind, so they will reap the tornado. The stalk does not have any standing grain. It will not produce any flour. Even if it would yield grain, foreigners will swallow it up. It's what happens to a nation that goes against the Word of God or a client nation such as ours that drifts away from the Word of God. What happens? Foreigners will swallow up our prosperity. You don't think that's happening today? Yes, it is. Foreigners streaming across the border like uh, nothing. There's nothing there. They just run across and they take jobs and you say, well, they need a job. Well, I have compassion on those people. They're poor down there. I understand that. But we are a nation of laws and we need to follow law. And so what happens? The foreigners swallow up all of your grain. They swallow up all of your jobs. And how do they do that? Well, they just come over and take it. And you say, well, it's no big deal. An American won't do it. Yes, an American will do it for the right wage. And so what? when a foreigner comes in and does it for three bucks, when an American would do it for seven, that lowers your wages. It lowers your standard of living. And this is what's happening in our own country. And that's just a uh, part of history that you can look at and say, well, yeah, that is happening. Then 8-8, eight, eight, soon Israel... You could even replace that with USA. Soon Israel will be swallowed up among the nations. They will be like a worthless pottery shred. Or shared or whatever. And that's what will happen to our country unless we get with the word of God. And that's where the influence comes from. And God honors those who love the word of God. God honors those pastors who teach the word of God. But it's not taught today. Do you know that most pastors today don't even know the salvation message? They don't even know how to give the salvation message. They give all types of things other than salvation. They don't even go by scripture. They go by how they feel. And what we need to know is the Bible. And that's what I teach here and that's all I'll ever teach is the Bible. And some people don't like it and it steps on people's toes. But I don't care. I'm not here to entertain. I'm here to do my job. And my job is to teach you what the Bible says. And in terms of salvation, I tell you, most pastors today don't understand it. A few do, and thank God for them, but most don't. If you were to ask some pastors, how are you saved, you'll get about 15 different answers from one pastor, or just go from pastor to pastor, and you'll end up with a plethora of answers. But what is salvation? What is it? Well, let's look at John 3.15. We're going to be flipping through quite a few verses until the next message. So John 3.15, we're going to look at salvation. We're going to look at what salvation's all about. And I'm going to show you how this is what the Bible says, but this is not. This is absolutely not what is being taught. But it's absolutely what the Bible says. And I'm not pulling it out of context, and you'll see that because I'm going to go through so many of them, you won't be able to argue with it. John 3.15 John 3.15 That everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. How do you have eternal life? Believe. That everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. How are you saved? 
believe. That's what the Bible says. And you say, well, that's one verse. Okay, here's another. John 3.16. Right after John 3.15, John 3.16 follows logically. For God loved the world so much that He gave His uniquely born Son in order that anyone who believes in Him shall never perish. Notice that. Shall never perish. For God loved the world so much that He gave His Son, the uniquely born one, in order that anyone who believes in Him shall never perish. Eternal security right there. Once you're saved, you're always saved. You might disagree with that, and that's because you haven't heard enough of me to know any better. Shall never perish, but have what? Eternal life. And how do you get it? Faith alone in Christ alone. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. John 3.18. John 3.18 lists, lists the word believe three times in a row. John 3.18. He who believes in Him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the unique person of the Son of God. Notice here that the word believe is repeated three times in this verse. There's no works added to it. Now I realize in the book of Matthew it says repent and believe, but we've went over that enough in the past and I can't go back to all of those things to explain it to you. But I can tell you right now, this is how you're saved. If it says it once in the Bible, it means it. And the Bible does not contradict itself. This is how you are saved. And they don't teach that anymore. What do they teach today? All types of things. Some people even go so far as to say you've got to go to church to be saved. Wrong. Some people say you've got to tithe to be saved. Wrong. You don't even have to tithe after you're saved. That's in the book of Malachi, Old Testament. Let's look at John 3.36. John 3.36. This is how you're saved. And it's good to probably write these verses down because you might come into a situation where you need to witness to somebody and you'll know what verses to show them or to talk to them about. Such as John 3.15, 3.16, 3.18, and 3.36 so far. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. What's it say? Believe. Does it say believe and invite? No. Now I know today most pastors get up and say you need to invite Christ into your heart. But I challenge you today as I've set out the challenge many times before in front of people. Show me the verse. Show me the verse. If you can show me the verse, I will repent, change my mind, and I'll say I was wrong. You can't show me the verse. You can't find it. I know you can. And I've had that... Uh, issued now for a year and a half and nobody's ever showed me the verse. If you want to disagree with it, show me the verse. You say, but isn't that just technical? If you invite Christ, aren't you saved? Well, if you believe in the Bible, no, you're not. Because the Bible gives you one specific way to be saved, and it's straight and narrow. Remember, in the book of Matthew, it says the way of salvation is straight and narrow. And why is it straight and narrow? There's only one way. Faith alone in Christ alone. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. That's the only way. That's why it's straight and narrow. Most people go the broad way. What's the broad way to salvation? Works. They want to work their way into heaven. And that's what all the religions of the world do. If you're a Muslim, how do you get your 72 virgins? you got to fly planes into buildings or you've got to uh, make sure you kill some Christians or you got to make sure you don't eat pork. And they have all these rules that they follow. And that's the broad way to salvation. And the Jews, what do they believe? Well, they go to the Wailing Wall and bob their heads up and down. And they think they're getting through that way. No, they're not. God's not impressed with somebody bobbing their head up and down on the Wailing Wall. It doesn't impress God. If God does what you do, about laughs at it. That's just, it's an, and people think they're getting through to God by doing something with their body, etc. That's religion. God's not impressed with religion. God is impressed with what Jesus Christ did on the cross. God is impressed with the fact that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ went to the cross and died as a substitute for us, and that impresses God the Father. We don't. And this is why we are saved by the most simple means, faith alone in Christ alone. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. 
But he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. So the issue in salvation is simply what? Believe in Christ. Not invite. Not any of those other things that you've heard. John 6.47 John 6.47 You should be beginning to see why our nation's in trouble because the priesthood, as it were, is not teaching correctly. They're not teaching the word. What are they doing? They're tickling, itching ears. They're entertaining people. And they haven't done enough study of the word to even know these verses. If they're in the Bible, why can't they pull them out and say, Hey, congregation, this is what you do. You believe in Christ to be saved. Why don't they do it? They're just like the uh, priest in Hosea. That's why. They're too busy trying to entertain people, too busy trying to line their pockets. If you want to be entertained, join a country club. If you want to be entertained, go to a, a movie theater. But that's not what church is for. What is church for? Reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. And reproof, that doesn't sound pretty, does it? No, it sounds harsh. That's exactly what it is. Reproof, correction. That is correction in your life so that you know what type of lifestyle of wisdom you should leave, lead, lead. Reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Not fun games and shows. John 6, 47, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me has eternal life. This is our Lord Jesus Christ talking. This is even in red. And how are you saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if it's in red or black. It's all the Word of God. It was all divinely inspired anyway. Or God breathed is how it actually comes out. John 11.25 John 11.25 also gives us a salvation verse and how to be saved. John 11, 25. You say, these are all in John. Oh, we'll get to some others that aren't in John. John eleven twenty five. Jesus said to her, who? Martha. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live, even if he dies. You say, that sounds too simple. You mean the only thing I have to do in life is believe in Christ and I'm saved? Yes, why do I say that? The Bible says it. And I'm not going to go against what the Bible says. And furthermore, Jesus Christ is the one who made it easy for us. Why is it so easy for us to go to heaven and simply believe in Christ and go to heaven? Because Jesus Christ took on the burden for us. And we don't have a burden anymore. He's taken on this load, this heavy load. And you know, it's really hard for many, it's difficult for many people to believe in Christ because many people don't want to give up their religious lifestyle. And they say, well, I'm going to heaven because I was a good father. I'm going to heaven because I was a good mother. I'm going to heaven because I did this, that, and the other. You don't go to heaven because you're good. There's a lot of good pre people burning in hell. You don't go to heaven because you're good. You go to heaven because of what Christ did on the cross. And they asked Billy Graham this. Actually, Larry King asked Billy Graham this. He said, on your tombstone, your eulogy, what do you want to put on there? And he said, uh, and uh, Larry King went on to ask, are you going to put on there and say what a good man you were and how you did this and that for the public, etc.? And he said, no. Larry King was kind of taken aback and said, well, what are you going to put? He said, I'm going to put on there how Jesus Christ was good for me. That's humility. And most people aren't humble enough to realize that Jesus Christ did all the work and they're working to get into heaven and they're trying to go across an insurmountable wall. You can't cross that wall. Only Jesus Christ can break that wall. And you have to believe in Christ. And that's the only way of salvation. And that's how Billy Graham was saved and that's how all of us are saved. And it's not by works which we, which we have done, which we will note in a moment. John 20:31. John 20, 31. Reason why our country's in trouble, people don't even understand these things. The most basic of things. The most basic thing called salvation. 
by the time you're through listening to this, you should be a wonderful person to witness to somebody else because you'll have these verses and be able to say, look, buddy, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and show them these verses because you've written them down and it'd be wise to go home and memorize them so you'd be good at witnessing. It's hard to witness when you don't know what you're talking about. John 20, 31. But these have been written that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that believing you might have life through His name. But these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. How are you saved? Believe, believe, believe. Not believe and invite, not invite only, simply believe. And again, I challenge you, look up and invite. It kind of shocks people when I say, you can't be saved by inviting Christ into your heart, and they look shocked because that's what they've heard all their lives. Show me the verse and I'll believe you. If you can't show me the verse, then go on believing what you believe and be like the people in Hosea's day and be a detriment to your own country. Because what we need is that somebody's going to wake up one day, somebody somewhere has to wake up one day and say to themselves, hey, this is the Word of God. It says these things for a purpose. It says these things for a reason. It's not just a bunch of writing. It actually means something. Acts 16.31 Acts 16.31 Not too far away from John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Acts 16.31 Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And if anyone in your household believes in Christ, they too are saved. That's what it means. Most people look at that and say, Oh, I believe and then my whole household saved. No, they have to believe too. But if you all believe, you're all saved. That's what it means. It's something that comes out of the Greek that I'm not going to go into right now. But what it means is this. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And if anyone in your household believes, they too will be saved. And notice the command is believe. Nothing else is added to it. Galatians 3.26 Galatians 3.26 I'm going to start speeding up after this because I have so many more verses to go over. What you can do is write them down and then for your own entertainment or your own edification, look it up later. Uh, because uh, we'll be flipping quite a bit if I keep going like this and it'll get uh, probably boring. Galatians 3.26 For you are all the children of God, that is the royal family of God, by faith in Christ Jesus. Again, nothing's added to faith. It's faith alone. For you are all the children of God. How? We are all the children of God. How? By faith in Christ Jesus. Notice there's nothing there about inviting Christ anywhere. Notice there's nothing there about uh, dedicating yourself. Notice there's nothing there about making Christ Lord. Notice there's nothing there about committing yourself to anything. You know what most people do? They commit themselves to the Lord on Sunday and they have to do it all over again the next Sunday. And they commit and recommit and dedicate and rededicate. Where is it in the Bible that you're doing all this stuff? Now there are certain uh, verses that might be a bit confusing to you, but we went over them before. And all of these verses I'm giving you now are just to set you straight on there's only one way of salvation and that's the most important thing you need to know now. And it's the most important thing our nation has drifted away from. They used to teach these things in the, uh, when our nation was founded in 1776. They taught these things. They taught faith alone in Christ alone. It's just until recently, actually over the past 40 years, that people have really drifted away from this. Why? They've drifted away from the Word. They've gone in for entertainment. They want a, a pastor to entertain them, to entertain their children, to entertain them so that they can have an adults class and, a, and so that they can have a, um, a place where married people go for social life and they can have a place where divorced people can go to meet somebody else and so they can have a place for uh, uh, people who are single to go so that they can meet other nice people. That's not what church is for. 
Just as God brings you the salvation message, just as God brought Jesus Christ as a Savior to us, Jesus Christ brings you right man or right woman. He does all the work. Most people think they have to go chasing after women to find her. Guess what Adam did? Nothing. What did he do? Well, he got lonely and God said, well, it's not good for man to be alone. And who brought the woman? God. God brought the woman to Adam. Did he go to a singles class? No, he didn't have to. God brings you the right woman. Wait on the Lord. And you might be discouraged. Not many young people here, that is teenagers, and I'll never be able to find anyone if I stick around here. Yes, you will. God's not limited. God will send you your right person. You see, the purpose for church is not to hook you up with somebody except Jesus Christ. Is to hook you up with Jesus Christ and to hook you up with the Word of God so that you can live a life of happiness. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be added unto you. What do you do first? The Word of God. Then what? Everything will be added unto you. You don't have to work for it. Jesus Christ does all the work and that's the most wonderful thing about being a Christian is you can rest. And there's some books over there. That I think one of them is called The Faith Rest Drill. There's another one. It's a little pamphlet called Christian at Ease, and it has all the little uh, promises of God in them that you can claim. Not little. They're all important. But all the promises of God that you can claim so that you can live a life of uh, contentment. And they're, of course, free of charge. Pick them up. You can take all those from me, and I won't care. I'll be happy. Take them all. Whatever you want to do, just take them and read them for your benefit if you want to of course that's your free will so now we'll start moving uh, more quickly over these verses before we have a break and then have our second message Romans 1.16 you can write it down you can flip there if you got nimble fingers but I doubt you're that fast if you are well, you, you either have tabs or you've really read your Bible a lot Romans 1.16 I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. There again, it's simple faith alone in Christ alone. Believe. Romans 3, 20 through 22. Romans 3, 20 through 22. And this is where we get to the point where you don't work for salvation. Jesus Christ did all the work. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law is the knowledge of sin. The reason why we have the law is to bring us to a point that we know we are sinners. That's what we studied in Galatians. For, but now, apart from the law, apart from the Mosaic law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, that is Old Testament, even the righteousness of God through what? Faith in Jesus Christ. For all those who do what? Believe. It's that simple. Romans 3.28 Romans 3.28 For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Now if you've read through your Bible several times, you might say to yourself, what about the book of James? I remember reading James and he said, faith without works is nothing. Yeah, he did say that. And what you'd have to say to yourself is either one, the Bible contradicts itself, or number two, you're not interpreting it right. The answer is number two, you're not interpreting it right. This is dealing with after salvation. James was written for those who had already believed. And your faith, without using the faith rest real, actually what it's saying is a faith without converting, we've studied it before, it's technical and it comes out of the Greek. And what it means is if you do not convert gnosis, academic knowledge, gnosis in the Greek is G-N-O-S-I-S. And what you do, you see gnosis is like food on the table. It's like I present to you today food on the table. You can eat it or you can look at it and say, that's gross, I don't want it. It's your choice. But I'm like a chef. That's my job, to be a chef and to present to you the word as it is. And you might see it and say, yeah, that's uh, green beans, that's mashed potatoes, and that's country fried steak. Making me hungry thinking about it. But, and then you look at it and say, well, I like what I see, so you eat it. Now, just the food sitting on the table in the Greek is called gnosis. 
But when you cut it with your fork, put it in your mouth, and eat it and swallow, that becomes what is called epinosis, and that means beyond knowledge. And that is, you've, you've seen it, and you've believed it. And so as a chef, I give this to you, and you can say, I believe that, or you can say, that's the worst message I've ever heard, and I don't want it. That's fine. That's your choice. It doesn't bother me any. I'm impervious to that. I got a, I have an elephant's hide. I don't care. You either accept it or not. You either like what I have uh, given out or you don't. And if you don't, well, I just chalk it up as you haven't even been reading these verses with me. Romans 3.28, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. That was kind of a skimpy explanation of James, but I can't explain James right now. We're studying something else. Romans 4, 4 through 5. Romans 4, 4 through 5. Now to the one who works for salvation, his wages are calculated. They are calculated. Not on the basis of grace, but on the basis of debt. What's that mean? It means the more you work for salvation, the deeper in debt you go. Again, now to the one who works for salvation, his wages are calculated, not on the basis of grace, but on the basis of debt. The harder you work for salvation, if you're not already saved, the harder you, some people get saved and then keep working to be saved. Well, that's just uh, stupid. You're still saved, you're still going to heaven, but uh, working to keep on being saved is, is if Christ did not do enough. But to him who does not work for salvation, but believes in him who unjustifies the ungodly, his faith receives credit for righteousness. You go to a bank and you have a credit on one side and a debit on the other. We all know about that. You put a deposit, that's a credit. And uh, you take some money out to pay for some gas, that's a debit. A big debit lately. <laughs> So his faith receives credit for righteousness. So when you believe, you receive credit. And this is a credit you can, uh, you can always withdraw, but you always have it there. That is, you can always withdraw from the Word of God, but you never lose it. It's there. It's yours. Romans 4.14. Romans 4.14. For if those who by means of the law, the Mosaic law, are heirs then faith has been made void. If you think you're justified by the law, then your faith has been made void. And the promises have been canceled. What promises? All the promises we've been studying. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and, you've been, and you will be saved. If you try to add something to it, it's void. That is, if at the moment you decide that you want to be saved and you... Believe in Christ, but then you add something to it. You're not saved. That's what it's saying. It's debt. You must believe and only believe. When you add something to it, it's credited to you for debt. It's not from my lips. It's from Paul's lips from Romans 4, 4 through 5. Galatians 2, 16. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ... Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. You're not justified by what you do or by who and what you are. You're justified by who and what Christ is and what He did. And the reason why our country is suffering is because people are going away from who and what Jesus Christ is and going toward who and what they are. And they're building up for themselves a huge ego if you think to yourself you can save yourself and you can add to what Jesus Christ did on the cross by who and what you are and what you do you have just built the biggest ego on the planet and the reason why our country is suffering is there are some fat heads walking around thinking they are saved by who and what they are thinking they're saved by what they've done what can you do that is any greater than what our Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross when he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can you do any better than that? No! You can't. 
It's impossible. Christ made it easy for you so that the only thing you have to do is faith alone in Christ alone. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Acts 16.31a. And that's how simple it is. And uh, you say it sounds too simple and I feel sorry for you. Because you'll be working up a sweat for the rest of your life trying to claw your way into heaven when it's already been provided. It's already been provided by Christ. What can you do? So how are we justified in the eyes of God? Romans 5.1 Therefore, Romans 5.1 Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That means Jesus Christ did all the work. Ephesians 2.8 and 9 For you have been saved by grace through faith. And that's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Philippians 3, 9. And may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account for righteousness. You were saved in the Old Testament the same way you're saved today. Faith. Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to him for righteousness. And we are saved the same way and we are credited righteousness when we believe. Not when we work, but when we believe. And you say, are you saying I can just be saved? Well, if that's the case, I can just go out of here after class and go to a bar and raise hell. You can do that, but you'll be punished because you're a child of God now. I'm not saying you should. You have volition to do what you want, but now you're a child of God. And whom the Lord loves, he punishes and scourges alive with a whip every son whom he receives. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you become a child of God. And anything you do that is out of line, and when you go out of fellowship in terms of sin, whatever your favorite category of sin may be, your favorite category of sin may be gossip, maligning, judging. Your favorite category might be going out, raising hell, getting drunk, doing drugs, fornicating. They're both on the same side of sin. They're both sins. You still have to name those sins. But you do that, guess what? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, that will he also reap. And know for yourself that this is not a license for you to be the worst sinner in town. I've never said that and Paul never said that. I'm just telling you that Jesus Christ did all the work. And what you do when you're saved and what you do after salvation is your choice. But you better get with the Word. You better learn the Word of God. And if you don't, you will be punished. you either be punished for running around and being the town gossip or the town drunk. You know, just two different sides of a coin. You just flip the coin. Uh, town drunk, sinner. Town gossip, sinner. Old lady gossip, old man drunk, both sinners. They have to name their sins, and we're all sinners, by the way. There's no reason we should ever stick our nose up in the air and look down and say at somebody and say, ooh, what a sinner. We're all sinners, and we know it. We might have to we might think to ourselves our sins are a bit more justified or our sins are a bit holier than someone else's sins, but uh, it's still not pleasing to God. So we must name our sins when we sin, first John one nine, so that we can be filled with the Spirit. Now in Second Timothy three fifteen it says, and that from Second Timothy three fifteen and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. That's 2 Timothy 3.15. I said I was going to go fast. I know people are flipping. But I want to cram some stuff in here. Maybe I could slow down. i got time, I guess. 1 John 5.11-13 1 John 5.11-13 and this is the deposition that God has given to us eternal life. Who's given to you eternal life? God. You haven't accredited it to yourself. You haven't given yourself eternal life. God gives it. And you didn't make God give it. He did it on His own free will. And this is the deposition that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son, Jesus Christ. He who has the Son has life. 
That's 1 John 5.11. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the person of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you better rest assured you have eternal life. So salvation is by grace. Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 3.24. Romans 4, 4 through 5. Now to the one who works for salvation, we went over this, his wages are credited not on the basis of grace, but on the basis of debt. Romans 4.16, For this reason it is by means of faith, in order that you might be saved on the basis of grace. Romans 5.1-2, through 2, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have obtained an introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Now why is our country in so much trouble? Nobody teaches this. A few people teach this, but not many people teach this anymore. They want to tickle people's ears. They want to give them a, a brownie points for how good they are. And that's none of the pastor's business. And it's none of the business of the people in the congregation. And why is this country in trouble? Because congregations today, for the most part, do nothing but gossip, malign, and judge, and backstab. And say, ooh, isn't she a sinner? Gossip, gossip, gossip. Ooh, isn't he a sinner? Ooh, I heard he slept with so-and-so. Ooh, I heard I saw him at the bilo and he got some beer. Ooh, I saw this and that at the other. Gossip, gossip, gossip. God's not pleased with that. What are you thinking? Is that what church is for? And when you look at politics and when you look at the trouble this country is going through, look at yourself first. We are royal priests, 1 Peter 2.5 and 2.9. We are royal family of God. And we've been given a responsibility to become what is called invisible heroes. That's to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior so that we can have an impact on our country. So that we can become what is called part of a pivot. And that means so that we can protect this country from all the evil that's out there, both internally and externally. And we'll never make it in this country unless people go back to the Word of God. And I don't mean go back to moralism. I mean go back to the Word of God. Go back to what Scripture says. And if people don't go back to what the Scripture says, we're doomed as a country. And what you saw on 9-11 will be peanuts compared to what God can do to us. And you say, oh, God did that? He did it to wake us up, I guarantee it. The Bible says, what disaster has God not known about? He knows about every disaster that occurs. And sometimes, as Hosea was trying to teach the people, if you don't straighten out people and get with the word, you'll be destroyed. It might be discouraging on this fourth, but it should be encouraging for you to get with the word. Now, I'm not against my country. I love my country. Every time I sing the Star Spangled Banner or even hear it or watch it on a football game or a hockey game or whatever foot, uh, sport my wife is watching on television, whatever she's watching, I hear that. I get choked up every time. I love my country. But it's just sad. Nobody seems to be caring about what the Word of God has to say. Now, we'll have a 15-minute break. If you didn't like it, skedaddle. If you did, you can come back. But we'll have a 15-minute break, and then uh, we will resume. It won't be an hour next time. It'll be more like 45 minutes. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us concerning the things we've noted. May we come to understand the importance of what the Word of God has to say. And may we grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.